So it looks like, um, is there anybody who is unable to unmute so that we can have staff? <clears throat> okay, Sonia, can we can you let me know when we have a quorum so that we can begin? like it. Yes, we definitely have a quorum. Okay. So let me bring up my agenda. We will go ahead and begin the February 5th, 2021 uh, St. Paul Planning Commission meeting. Um, it has been determined that it's not practical nor prudent for the commission and its com uh, committees to meet in person or pursuant to Minnesota statute section 13D.02. In light of the ongoing pandemic, it is not feasible for the commission to present at the regular location and all members of the commission will be attending today via the um, Microsoft Teams app or uh, through other electronic telephonic means. It is also not feasible for members of the public to attend the meeting and its regular location due to the ongoing pandemic. And so currently no meeting is being held at the City Hall Conference Center uh, in the Kellogg uh, building. So we'll begin today's meeting by doing a roll call, Sonia. Um. Commissioner Anderson is excused today. Commissioner Baker? Here. Commissioner DeJoy? Here. Commissioner Edgerton? Here. Commissioner Grill? Here. Commissioner Hong? Here. Commissioner Hood? Here. Commissioner Oliver? Commissioner Lindy? Here. Commissioner McMurtry? Here. Commissioner Wichipa? Here. Commissioner Perryman? Here. Commissioner Presley? <laughs> okay, Commissioner Risberg? Here. Commissioner Said? Here. Commissioner Underwood? Here. And of course, the chair. All right. So the first item on the agenda today is we do have three new commissioners joining us. They will be sworn in today. Um, the commissioners are Mr. Jacob Riley, uh, Mr. Simon Tagioff, and Zaijun Yang. Luis uh, will miss it. Who from the city will be doing the swearing in? I believe we have our city uh, city clerk with us. Yes, I'm here. Good morning. Good morning. OK, if I could have the three um, incoming commissioners, if you have a camera and want to turn it on, this would be the time. If you're not comfortable doing that or don't have the ability, that's fine, too. Um, I'll be administering the oath to all three of you at that same time. If you could please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your names. I, I Jacob Riley. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. swear. To support the constitutions. To support, to support the constitutions. Of the United States. Of the United, United States, States. And of the state of Minnesota. And of the state of Minnesota. And, Minnesota. and to discharge faithfully. And, and discharge, discharge faithfully. faithfully. The duties <coughs> devolving upon me. The duties devolving upon me. On me. As a member of the Planning Commission. As a, As a member, member of the Planning, of the planning commission. commission. Of the City of St. Paul. Of the of City of St. Paul. To the best of my judgment and ability. To the, the best of my judgment and ability. ability. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks, Sherry. 
So congratulations to the three new members. We look forward to working with you and hearing your input on the various subjects that we as a commission are tasked to address. Um, sometimes our meetings can get a little heated, and so we welcome your opinions um, into the discussion. The next item on the agenda, um, um, and I think uh, perhaps actually if you could just introduce yourself really quickly just with your name, um, sort of what, what brought you to the commission and what you look forward to doing, and then we can move on with the agenda. If we can start with Mr. Riley. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm Jacob Riley. I know many of you. Uh, I uh, uh, live in on the east side, um, and um, I worked for PD for almost 10 years, so I'm super excited to be here. I came to the Planning Commission because I care very, very much about St. Paul, and I'm looking forward to working on um, everything. I'm excited to be on this side of the uh, of the desk. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Uh, Mr. Yang. Uh, good morning, um, everyone and the chair. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. I joined the Metropolitan State University three years ago, and I'm teaching real estate finance. Part of my course is to incorporate the newly developed real estate program in St. Paul and uh, Minnesota and educate students about how the history uh, played around affecting our lives today. And uh, I'm so happy to get into the planning commission. I believe our commission has a huge role in affecting the future real estate development upon our metron cities. And I'm going to learn and do my best to contribute to your success. Thank you. Thank you and welcome Mr. Yang. Uh, Mr. Tagioff. Thank you. My name is Simon Tagioff. Um, I live in uh, Ward 2 in Summit Hill. Um, I've lived here for a few years. Um, I, I came to the Planning Commission initially through a degree of community organizing um, around some local streets related issues and um, that led me to uh, apply to serve on the Summit Hill Association District Council Board. Um, in, that capacity, in, in that capacity I worked on um, several issues that ended up coming before the Planning Commission as chair of the Zoning and Land Use Committee. Um, and uh, and that made me extremely interesting uh, uh, to be part of um, this this body. I've worked on several issues that have come before CNPC and, and the wider planning commission, and I'm excited to um, to join and, uh, and and work with you all. Thank you for your comments, uh, gentlemen. And um, we look I, like I said, we look forward to working with you. Uh, I don't have any new announcements for this week. Moving on to the next item, Luis. Do you have any announcements? Uh, <clears throat> Chair, yes, I do. Um, a few things to note uh, today, this morning. Good morning, everybody. Congratulations and welcome to the new new commissioners and uh, good morning to everybody else. Um, just wanted to point out, some of you may have seen this, but uh, the City Council this uh, week um, put forth a, a resolution of the city's priorities um, uh, for the MnDOT rethinking I-94 project. Um, so I think a similar resolution has moved forward recently in Minneapolis. Uh, I encourage you to read it. Um, I can put the link in the um, in the box. Um, hopefully that went through. Secondly, um, uh, happy to note, uh, and the commissioners on the Comprehensive and Neighborhood Planning Committee know this already, but we've been moving uh, forward on the parking regulations zoning study. Um, and so uh, Tony Johnson, Menica Mohan have been working really hard on that. Um, we do uh, have a website now for the study uh, and I will share that. Um, we also have a um, email address if you have questions. We're uh, not yet taking comment on the study because we haven't opened the um, public comment period. 
Uh, but uh, if you have big questions and maybe the website doesn't answer them, uh, if, or if you know others in the community that have questions about the parking study, uh, feel free to uh, refer them to the website and, and the um, email address. Um, lastly, I'll just note and uh, highlight um, later in the meeting, I'm going to be going through um, a few documents uh, that I sent. Um, uh, one I sent in advance and, and the other one I sent before the meeting. Uh, so the one uh, sent uh, a couple days ago it was the Planning Commission Annual Report for 2020. Um, commissioners that uh, are not new uh, will, will know that we do this every year around this time as part of our annual meeting. We look back at the previous year uh, to see what items, you know, what major items uh, the commission looked at as well as some other things uh, that we decided to list this year just given how it was a different sort of year, uh, 2020 as well as a couple of documents I forwarded just earlier today, um, both our 2021 work program, as well as um, an additional kind of look at 2020 from sort of a milestone perspective uh, projects. A lot of our projects go on for um, more than just uh, a year. Um, so just being able to measure progress on, on where we're at with those things. So I'll walk the commission through that later in the meeting, but just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Um, before moving on to the next, uh, any questions for the director before we go on? And I should note, um, the Teams app gives you a, a, a variety of ways of alerting the presenters of how, of wanting to speak. Um, but if you could, if the commissioners could please use the comment section to either type C or Q rather than raising your hands, that way we can keep a good, uh, I can keep a good track of who wants to speak and in what order and then I will call on you accordingly, accordingly instead of using the raising your hand feature. So I would appreciate it. So are there any questions for the director? All right, seeing none, we can move on to the next item is the zoning committee. Uh, Commissioner Baker. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, first, before I start, I also wanted to say just congratulations to all of our new commissioners. Looking forward to working with you. Um, I'll go ahead and start with the report. As of now, I haven't received an update of um, an updated list of agenda items for the um, upcoming site plan review meeting. Um, or the thought is, is when that information is available, uh, we'll send that out. Um, the upcoming zoning committee meeting is scheduled for February 11th, uh, with two items on the agenda for consideration: 981 University Avenue West, which is a conditional use permit uh, concerning building height and um, 1074 through 1096 James um, Avenue, um, the James Avenue apartments, a conditional use permit concerning building height and variances concerning front yard and rear yard setbacks. Um, for our January 28th zoning committee, we had one item under consideration. It was 1346 Arcade Street um, LLC, just to provide some information, which was a change and expansion of non-conforming use to add auto repair and um, outdoor auto sales uh, to the existing auto body shop um, and dwelling. Um, it also included variances for parking. Uh, to provide some background, the, the site uh, has a pretty ex extensive and complex history. Um, initially, there was a gas station on the site uh, that was converted to an auto body shop. Um, in staff's report, staff provided a very detailed um, um, timeline concerning the history um, of the site um, and then also findings um, that I would suggest those that um, need more information um, about the history uh, to review um, to really understand some of the complexities of the site. Um, so this item was laid over from the actually the January 14th uh, zoning committee meeting to allow staff to provide um, alternative findings and guidance to the zoning committee um, that really would support uh, allowing vehicle cleaning in the garage addition behind the house and and allowing the spray booth addition um, and clear avenue curb cuts to remain. Uh, there there was no one just to give you also I know I went over this, but I just want to make sure that everybody's clear on this application there uh, last time. There was no one that spoke in favor or opposition of the application. 
Um, however, there were two letters of support for the application. Um, the public hearing for the application um, was open during the January 14th zoning committee meeting, and hence it was closed during a last um, zoning committee meeting. Um, so no one, um, there was no public testimony. Uh, I also want to highlight that the Payne Phelan District 5 Council's Executive Committee recommended approval uh, of the application. Uh, the Zoning Committee voted 6-0 for approval of this application with nine additional conditions. Um, and denial of the variance, variances uh, of required parking. Uh, there was approval with conditions of variances of required landscaping and minimum distance between vehicular access and the arcade clear intersection. And there was a memo also provided by staff, Mr. Dermody, that really laid out um, um, some of the specifics um, of this conversation. Um, but uh, chair, again, uh, the zoning committee moved 6-0 approval for this application. Thank you, Commissioner Baker. So the motion coming out of committee is approval of the non-conforming use to add an auto repair and outdoor auto sales to an existing auto body shop. Um, approval of the variance for um, uh, for everything except for the parking, correct? Commissioner Baker? Uh, yes, sir. That is correct. Okay, thank you. So that is the motion. Um, is there any discussion? Seeing on Sonia, could we get a roll call? Okay. okay. Commissioner Baker? If that was Baker, yes. Yes. Commissioner Doy? Yes. Commissioner Edgerton? Yes. Commissioner Grill? Yes. Commissioner Hood? Yes. Commissioner Hong? Yes. Commissioner Lindeke? Yes. Commissioner McMurtry? Yes. Commissioner Muchipa? Yes. Commissioner Said? Yes. <clears throat> Commissioner Perryman? Yes. Commissioner Presley? Yes. Commissioner Risberg? Yes. Commissioner Underwood? Yes. Commissioner Riley? Uh, it looks like Commissioner Riley will be abstaining. Thank Commissioner you. Riley, is that just for this particular matter or for both matters today? For both matters today. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Tagoff? <laughs> Tagoff, um, I'll abstain from this particular vote. Thank you. You're abstaining too? Okay. Uh, from this vote, yes. And Commissioner Yang? I abstain for the all decision today. For Is that going to be for both or just this one? Uh, both. Okay, thank you. Unanimous. All right, so that motion for approval of uh, non-conforming use along with the variance except for the parking variance is approved. The next item, Commissioner Baker. Uh, uh, Chair, uh, the next item is our Lexington Station apartments. Um, this item uh, was before us last time and we voted on it. From my understanding, um, it's coming back before us and I want to pass that over to you and staff to highlight um, staff's perspective on this um, as we move forward. Thank you, Commissioner Baker. So this item did come before us two weeks ago. The procedural posture of it was uh, it, it was an approval by staff. The staff drafted a report. It came to the committee, uh, the zoning committee. The zoning committee at that time approved um, the, the staff recommendations. It then came before us in the planning commission two weeks ago. Um, there was a lot of discussion uh, on both on approval and denial of it before we took a vote. Uh, the motion coming out of committee was to approve. Uh, the motion failed um, and we were working on drafting uh, or excuse me, the commissioners who voted in denial 
were working on coming up with the language for the purpose of the denial, and it was laid over for two weeks to give them additional time to make sure that we were doing things appropriately. Um, at this time, uh, we do need to take a vote on this matter. Uh, we, the, the, uh, I think our obligation has not, well, we need to fulfill or finish um, providing the, the basis for the denial. And I believe we left off with Commissioner Perryman, who was uh, in the process of trying to make a motion and also Commissioner Wong. Um, so I see that there is a comment by Commissioner Perryman. Commissioner Perryman, I was gonna turn the floor over to you. Gotcha. Well, turn on my video. What's up? Welcome, new commissioners. Uh, yeah, I motion to deny the site plan based on finding one. The site plan is inconsistent with the 2040 comp plan, specifically relating to various core values and community priorities, including equity, affordably, affordability, and sustainability. Okay, is that the sole basis, Commissioner Perriman? Yes. Okay. So the basis for the denial um, is number one, um, relating to the comp plan, is, uh, is there a second? Second. And who is that? Naida. Uh, Mr. So motion made by Commissioner Perryman, seconded by Commissioner Presley. I think at this time we can have discussion on the motion and I see Commissioner Edgerton has a comment. Commissioner Edgerton. Uh, thank you, Chair. A question and a comment. First, I, I was not at the uh, last meeting, so do I vote? So I did not vote then. Do I vote now? I believe um, I, I will turn it over to Mr. Warner. I believe that as long as you have reviewed all the materials, you were present for all the testimony um, provided uh, into the record during zoning committee, uh, Commissioner, I mean, um, Mr. Warner. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, the Commissioner can vote. Okay, th thank you. So my comment then, I guess what I would say is, uh, this is my personal opinion. I don't personally see a legitimate reason to deny this application. Uh, in my opinion, it meets the zoning code requirements, does not require any variances. It's not uh, asking, not receiving any subsidies from, from the public. The comp plan does have goals of affordable housing, sustainability, et cetera. Um, but uh, this, the comp plan does not require all uh, applications, all new uh, uh, developments to have an affordable housing component to them. And so I don't really see that general goal as a justifiable reason to deny any application that doesn't have affordable, uh, an affordable housing component. Uh, and I just feel that uh, we we shouldn't be denying an application just because we don't like it. You know, we're not kings here. We have rule of law here in St. Paul, Paul. And so I plan to uh, not vote for denial. Commissioner Baker. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I will defer to staff. It seems Mr. Pereira has um, a comment before. Uh, before I uh, make my comments, if that's certainly, okay. uh, Director Pereira. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chair and and um, Commissioners. Uh, I just wanted to rewind a little bit and uh, follow up on something that was said at the last meeting. So, um, we had talked about finding number one, compliant consistency, um, as a possible, you know, finding to deny, um, and. The chair and uh, the chair indicated, and I confirmed, but I had a little bit of doubt when I confirmed it that you know the uh, finding of comp plan consistency alone uh, could not be um, the sole rationale for denying a site plan that meets all other the uh, all other required zoning findings. Um, I I did have a chance to follow up after the meeting to confirm that uh, understanding and uh, checked with CAO City Attorney's Office. Uh, so they confirmed that um, 
based on you know understanding of Minnesota case law that a comp plan alone as a regulatory device, um, especially with respect to the approval of conditional use permit and site plan applications, um, is reasonably doubtful. So using that um, understanding of of law and and sort of cases on this on this matter in the past, uh, and I don't want to speak for the city attorney's office. So uh, Peter Warner's here. Um, if you'd like to also comment, I would I would uh, encourage you to to also weigh in on that. I just wanted to put that out there for the commission as you think about uh, the motion. Thank you, Cadet Director Pereira. And um, for clarification as well, uh, we also, uh, lay, the, the motion was to lay over for those who uh, wanted to file, well, raise a motion in opposition or to deny to have an opportunity to, to speak with staff. And it's my understanding that staff determined that their recommendation could not change. Is that correct? Or would uh, they didn't see a basis for changing it? Chair, correct. So staff uh, took a hard look at uh, the, the two uh, communicated rationales coming out of that meeting on the 22nd and um, looked back at the staff report and uh, considered those things. And we don't see a, a reason or rationale um, to form the basis of uh, denial. Um, I'll let Mr. Warner uh, go first, and then I'll go back to Commissioner Baker. Uh, Mr. Warner. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, Commissioners, and welcome new Commissioners. Congratulations. Uh, I just wanted to comment uh, to follow up on on, on uh, what the uh, Planning Administrator has, has said, and it, it's simply a, a reiteration of advice that I've given in the past uh, that uh, comprehensive plans are not regulatory tools. They're visionary tools. Uh, the way the vision in a comp comp comprehensive plan is made into a regulation is through the adoption of official controls. Uh, the city does not yet have an official control adopted with respect to affordability. Uh, and to also remind you that when you make your decisions, your decisions have to be reasonable and factually based. And so um, with that, um, I will simply say that relying on a to deny a site plan application on a comprehensive plan goal that does not have a, an accompanying uh, official control that's been adopted into the zoning code uh, is uh, there is legal risk to that. Uh, that's pretty much my, my comment on that. Thank you, Mr. Warner. Uh, Commissioner Baker. OK, thanks, Chair. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm, I, um, I appreciate uh, staff providing some context. Um, I think uh, just just a few points. First point is I, I want to highlight because I don't think I need to say any more based on what staff said. Um, I voted um, I voted for this uh, for this project to move forward, which means that I was against the motion last time. Um, and I just want to highlight a few things. First thing is I completely understand and um, connect with the community and also my fellow commissioners um, with the concern around um, the affordability aspects um, of this project. Um, I also think that uh, the applicant could have done a whole lot more to connect with the community, keep them involved, um, allow them to be a part of the process, almost bring them alongside. Um, when you are coming into a neighborhood, you are uh, potentially trying to propose um, a building um, in an area, and I just think that more could have been done with engagement. That being the case, um, I, I truly do believe that um, affordability right now isn't necessarily a part of this conversation, the task at hand that we have to deal with concerning the site plan. And I, I want um, my fellow commissioners to think through what other options, think about uh, the affordability and some other things that came up and knowing um, that we, we may not be able to address it with this 
um, application, how and what other means and mechanisms can we get at some of those barriers that we see? And those are the kinds of conversations that I think that we need to have as commissioners and also with the city. Um, I do think that we have a sphere of influence and a span of control. And I think some of the things that came up may be venturing outside of that span of control. I am in agreement with uh, more affordability uh, for housing in this specifically in this area. I also am in agreement uh, that there just needs to be more housing here in St. Paul. We as a commission have consistently said that there's an opportunity to do that. This site has been vacant for years. And I think that um, moving forward, um, that there is little that I can do based on my vote um, to deny this application. So thanks, Chair. Commissioner Lindicky. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, I just want to mirror what a lot of my colleagues have said today. Um, I've been thinking about this for two weeks. It's a difficult case. I because I agree with a lot of the comments that were um, in opposition to this application and um, um, what they were saying about affordability in St. Paul and how big of a crisis it is. Um, but unfortunately for us today, there's nothing about affordability in the zoning code. We don't have any regulations about the rents. Um, in our code, so we can't create those regulations by pointing to the comprehensive plan because it's not a legal document, as the city attorney has, has said today. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that I think if we pretend that we can vote yes or no on developments because of affordability concerns, um, it's not a good idea. We'll be misleading people, misleading the public or activists working on equity and social justice issues that are really important. Um, we don't really have that power and the zoning code doesn't do it today. So if we want to put rules about affordability into the St. Paul zoning code, we have to have these difficult conversations about translating those values that are in the comp plan into the legal details of regulation. It's not easy to do that. If we want to make those policies, we can look at Minneapolis where they have inclusionary zoning and are now putting uh, rent stab stabilization on a ballot measure uh, for the election this year. Um, those are interesting ideas. They're not silver bullets, but they're the kinds of things that we can do as a planning commission. So um, because we haven't done that work yet, um, this project meets all the zoning requirements and that's why I still support it. Uh, Commissioner DeJoy and then Commissioner Hood. Yes, thank you. Um, I guess some of my comments would be redundant, so I'll try and uh, not reflect back to the comprehensive plan and some of the comments I had. I um, I think it's a little misleading when we take almost three years to go through a comprehensive plan and then say it's not a legal document, it doesn't hold any weight. Um, the The entire theme of our comprehensive plan is equity. And there is plenty of um, comments about affordability, but I'll leave that at that. What I, what also was discussed is about um, preserving the unique geological, geographic, historic, significant characteristics of the city and environmentally sensitive areas. This is a community that has, um, quite a bit of low income people. It's it's part of the history of the city of St. Paul. And yet this development, let's not talk about affordability, it's access. There's going to be quite an, a large number of people in the neighborhood that will not have access to this development. And that's my comment. Commissioner Hood and then uh, Commissioner Wong. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I've been a planner for about 10 years professionally, and I can say that I am less confident now in my vision than I was over a decade ago. Um, you know, with this specific site, we have an impressive mix of complex issues from redlining to the construction of 94 and subsequent disinvestment. Um, and also too, just to kind of ad address another issue, um, the Wilder Foundation, which uh, it appears has been essentially speculative land banking for, you know, 12 to 15 years. And despite the work that uh, Wilder does, it, it, it really does feel like they could be doing something more on this parcel. Um, another thing too, that to me, it makes it feel like the city and the neighborhood doesn't have really control of our land where 
you can have something like a small provision in the Jobs and Tax Cut Act, which is the uh, Trump tax cut bill, which created federal opportunity zones that allows for tax advantage investments in, in areas like this. And the city too had um, selected this area to be one of the um, the number the small number of opportunity zones, and it, this type of um, this type of policy you know coming down from the federal level it doesn't really deliver the fine grained local urbanism that we love the type of building that we see today is the type of investment that we've seen across the country in opportunity zones. And it really feels weird that your community can be shaped by legislation that was drafted by the co-founder of Napster, um, as, as weird as that sounds. But, you know, as, a, as it pertains to the comp plan in general, um, one of the things that's been more humbling to me and something I've been thinking about a lot for the past two weeks is how you can have one document and you could have two people that look at it entirely different. So when we say, does this meet the comp plan? My thought as a planner is, look, this is a mixed use development near a light rail station on an infill site that doesn't tear down any buildings and includes some affordability. On paper, that absolutely looks like a win. However, there's a huge equity component in the comp plan. And it's weird. It's, it's like a weird balance that we need to strike and a fine line that we need to walk. And I, I mean, I just want to be upfront and say, as a citizen, it is shocking. The rents do seem high, even for affordable uh, housing. Um, you know, one of the things that my wife pointed out last night when we were talking about this is the the one bedrooms that are proposed, it's more than our mortgage on a three bedroom house. And that's really a wake up call for me um, in the housing crisis that we have. Um, thankfully, we we're lucky enough to, you know, have the resources to buy a house, you know, seven, eight years ago. But, um, but, I, but I keep coming back to this issue that we today need to make a quasi-judicial decision on the site plan. I've been thinking about the Taco Bell vote on Snelling that we had not too long ago. Uh, just a little confession. I like Taco Bell. That's not something I say publicly very often. But do I, do I think that's a good spot for a Taco Bell? Not really. Do we want more drive throughs Absolutely not. But does it meet our zoning code? It kind of does, right? Like, and, and, and that's really the issue at hand um, where we have to balance what we maybe personally want versus what the zoning code says. And as mentioned by previous um, uh, commissioners, our code doesn't give us a legal framework, like whether through the comp plan or through affordable housing, to deny this development. Um, inclusionary housing, I want to be on record of saying that's something that the city should do, but we don't have that framework today. So really for those reasons, I will um, kind of uh, be voting for, excuse me, in against the resolution today. So thank you. And I also apologize for taking five minutes of everyone's time. Uh, Commissioner Wong and then Commissioner McMurtry. Thanks, Chair. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this vote and it's been really weighing on me for many reasons and I want to take the time to share why because um, it's actually not just about this vote or even about this development. It's really about how um, I want to approach our responsibility as planning commissioners and how I want to be engaged in the broader field of urban planning. And one of the dynamics that I've seen a lot in planning, and this is across many experiences, multiple cities, not just St. Paul, is whiteness in planning. And when I say that, I don't mean white people in planning. I mean whiteness that has been embedded in the institutions and codes and systems and laws that we have all as a commission and staff inherited, right? It shows up in so many places and it's a challenge that we're all tackling together as commissioners and with staff's abundant abundant support. Um, and I think this this whiteness in planning is like a huge iceberg because systemic change is hard and takes a long time and a lot of work to move. Um, for, our, for our communities, it's like sharp icicles with, with very acute and very specific harm. Sorry, everyone. Just give me a couple seconds to to gather myself. Thanks for your patience. Um, and and whiteness and planning is, is hard to define, but I think we know it when we see it.
it is it is using area median income to define affordability when that disadvantages and effectively excludes the low wealth and BIPOC residents who need affordable housing the most. It is saying that this site has been blighted for so long. And at least someone wants to do something about it without acknowledging that vacant land and blight are an intentional result of racialized disinvestment and redlining. It is preferring the cultural, economic, and physical displacement of low wealth BIPOC renters over an empty lot. It is taking an incredibly complex community development issue that will impact hundreds of BIPOC low wealth renters and simplifying it down to a potential legal risk. Whiteness is asking residents to trust us with their dreams and visions of a future community, asking them to engage and contribute to comp plans and station area plans and neighborhood plans, asking them to put their labor and their dreams and their vision into that. And then breaking that trust when the rubber hits the road, because it turns out that their engagement and their voice doesn't hold any water. It is asking residents for engagement when it benefits plans, but creating barriers to listening to them and allowing us to listen to them when it might create tensions or problems. So for, for all of those reasons, um, I'm choosing to vote along with Commissioner Perryman because I don't want to perpetuate this harm with the power that I hold as a planning commissioner. And I know, I know very well that whatever decision is made here goes to city council, could be changed, could be overturned, could be kept. But I just want to walk away from this call knowing that I did everything as a commissioner to live up to those values that we claim supposedly as a city and to be accountable to the people that I represent. Thank you. Commissioner McMurtry, um, and thank you for those comments, Commissioner Wong. Uh, Commissioner McMurtry? Thank you, Chair. I just had one question uh, from my own understanding. What happens in, in the event that today's resolution um, is denied? What happens next with um, just with this process? Um, I have a, a an understanding of it, but I think for to get an, a complete accurate understanding, I'll turn to Mr. Warner. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Commissioner, one possibility might be that uh, a denial of the application would cause the applicant to appeal to City Council. The applicant may choose not to appeal to City Council in the event of a denial, but the applicant certainly would have the opportunity to do that in the event of a denial. Gotcha. Thank you. Commissioner Perryman. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Wong, uh, for those comments as, as well. Um, yes, yeah, so just going back to a few things. Uh, Taco Bell was brought up. I am a huge fan of Taco Bell. I don't hide that one, um, but that was a, a slightly different uh, situation, of course. Uh, it wasn't a site plan, but uh, quoting uh, previous commissioners, some, some did use their kingly powers to deny that one, even though it was uh, 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 overturned and voted in support of by the uh, the planning commission so the zoning committee voted against that one planning commission voted to support that and then it was appealed to the city council uh, so stating that we do have the ability to uh, vote on these things as we feel that with our own uh, rationale from our own findings and information um, the the there's been talks of legal ramifications and and statements that i feel have been somewhat intimidating to uh, commissioners, uh, that is not a fear that we should have. No one's going to uh, uh, come and take your house away from you for for this vote. You have the ability to to vote based on uh, your your findings and your and your rationale. Um, we have if we lined up every decision we've made, there is definitely not a universal 
uh, vote from from anyone. Uh, people have used their own findings and information. Um, and yeah, just going back to Commissioners Wong, it's the uh, I, I made my decision up on this long ago. But of course, we don't live in we're not a sequestered uh, jury living in a silo. We see the, the the emails that come and the comments and different things, and it's and it's the people saying, "Oh, it's an eyesore. I, I don't like it being nothing." Versus this is going to be a life altering change for community members and those do not sit same on the scale uh, for me. So we have this ability to do this uh, if if not now when uh, multiple commissioners have talked about the that this continues to happen and we do nothing. But we have the power and the ability to do this now. Um, so yes, that's my comment. Thank you. So uh, I see Commissioner Tagiop wants to make a comment. Commissioner Tagiop, are you going to be abstaining from the vote or, or was it just for the first? I know the other two commissioners said it would be for both votes, but I don't think you said it was going to be for both. Is that correct? That's correct. I feel um, I feel comfortable voting on the um, on the motion that's before us, which is whether to approve or deny based on um, the comp plan alone. I feel that's a, I feel that's a decision I can take a I can take an opinion on. Um, the comment I wanted to make on this, and I wanted to assure my um, my fellow commissioners that I have spent numerous hours over the past um, two weeks reviewing the uh, complete public record on this, reading all the documents, and I feel like I understand this um, development reasonably well. Um, on the vote itself, I accept the legal um, advice essentially that our hands are tied, um, essentially a visionary doc, um, it's not a regulatory control. Um, however, that doesn't mean that there are no issues with this um, with this application. Um, reviewing it, it is characterized by a, a lack of engagement and a lack of respect for the surrounding communities. You can see that in numerous aspects of the building's um, design, its massing, which is designed to occupy the entire site and be as tall as possible and create as much profit as possible for the developer. The lack of attention paid to um, Anything in, in terms of the way it sits in the landscape and and, and the other um, other buildings nearby, there's no there's no attempt to that attention to that at all. Um, for example, the um, the Carty Heights development to the immediate southwest has a garden, which is supposedly for I imagine for the residents to walk around, and that garden will now be in shadow, um, and they will be deprived of any meaningful views aside from a six story building. Um, there's very little attention paid to ensuring there are complete sidewalks and complete streets. Um, the the people who, who are listening to this call um, and will have worked so hard potentially on community driven initiatives through district councils such as the Lexington area station plan um, should um, I think should be justifiably enraged and angered. There was a thorough community process and to set aside as, um, um, an, an area plan that's extremely well thought out and very specific um, on details such as connecting Fuller Avenue and things like this um, on the basis of some language in, in essentially a footnote saying that, oh, well, until the city takes action, we can disregard, um, strikes me as being very um, antithetic towards the, towards the community, whatever the legal status of that. Um, I do think there are a number of problems with this development in terms of its compliance with the um, with particularly the T4 zone district. I don't think it's pedestrian friendly. I think it impedes pedestrian access, particularly east to west. Um, I don't think it, um, it, it cogn it's cognizant of any pre-existing city approved plans as it's required to do under 66.344A. Um, evidently no if it was made for any form of um, connection and incorporation to the surrounding area. Um, I don't think it's in compliance with B2, which is transitions to lower density neighborhoods. Little to no attention has been paid to transitions of any kind in density. Um, and I don't think it pays attention to 66.344 B16, which is the interconnected street and alley network. Um, the existing street and alley network should be preserved and extended as part of any new development. Um, if the street network has been interrupted, it should be restored wherever possible. Um, I see nothing in the, um, in, in the nature of the site. In fact, it was two parcels, presumably to allow um, an east-west connection. The developer chose to make a single mast building with no through access, for example. Um, this is all by way of comment to say that um, I, I strongly disagree with this um, application as formed, even if um, I understand that on the basis of the narrow motion today, which is can we deny on the basis of the comp plan, I 
feel we regrettably cannot. Um, I think there are a number of grounds that the committee could consider, and I'm, it's a shame they have not. That's my comment. I see Commissioner Muchapau and then um, well, Commissioner Muchapau. And before uh, going to Commissioner Muchapau, it, it looks like some uh, people who are members of the community who are uh, attending today, and we thank you for taking the time. Um, we know that this is an incredibly important vote for the community, uh, but I would ask commissioners to disregard any comments that are outside of the public record, um, as this is a quasi-judicial uh, uh, application. Commissioner uh, Muchapa. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, okay. So first, I just want to thank all the commissioners, uh, particularly Commissioner Hong, DeJoy, um, and Perryman for your motion. And I agree with all of you. Um, and I've said this so many times before, too, that like we find ourselves in this situation over and over again. So I'm not I'm just I don't want to repeat everybody. I just want to say that I really agree with those things. And this this is not the first time that this has happened. Um, I want to encourage commissioners that are on the fence or um, still trying to make your decision on on this vote that like you can vote against it. I know that there is a strong argument that there's no legal finding that um, uh, could, I guess, legitimize this vote if you vote against it. But um, th that is still an option. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not a lawyer. And so um, but what I hear often is that, um, you know, a lot of law is based on precedent. And I, I, I couldn't I cannot vote to approve this, um, I can't set that precedent. I mean, like, I feel like we are constantly just put in this position and where our hands are tied and we cannot, like, we feel like we can't make a decision and like setting that precedent, I think is not the direction that we wanna go in as a city and as commissioners. So I will um, be voting to support uh, Commissioner Perryman's motion. Commissioner Baker. Thanks, Chair. I will be brief. I, I don't. Um, I don't think that I may be wrong on this, but um, I guess to support others that says that uh, you can you can vote against this uh, application. I completely agree, and I I I am planning to vote to move this application forward. Um, but I do want to highlight that um, I know that a lot of these um, applications start to get very um, the conversation starts to get tense. And even though I am voting to move this forward, I will not say to a fellow commissioner, and I, my goal is not to threaten um, any commissioner to say um, that there will be an issue if you um, vote against it. You will, you will, you were pulled into this commission uh, for a certain reason and a certain perspective, and we all have one vote. I respect all of those that uh, vote, even if you vote against me. Um, I've stated why I am going to vote the way I do. Um, but I also want to agree um, that everybody needs to vote where they feel with a basis on uh, moving forward. So that's all I'll say, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Baker. Um, and I appreciate those comments. I, I do think it's a it's a divisive uh, question, um, and I think it it, it poses uh, almost like an internal. Uh, questions of ourselves, not, not of ourselves, but of, 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 of like Commissioner Hood said, two people can view um, a standard or uh, a particular application and both have uh, reasonable, rational reasons for why, why they view the, the, the item the way that they do. And I, and I think we, it's more about having respect for both views and certainly to Commissioner Perryman's point, um, I, you know, uh, he's in there. The commission can, uh, as long as we, as long as the, there's factual reasons articulated, uh, even if it's a, a advice a council um, vote to deny, um, whether or not that's advisable, that would be for each independent commissioner to to make that determination. Uh, commissioner Underwood, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll be brief. I, I just wanted to. Um, uh, I really, really appreciated um, things everyone has said, and uh, and something Commissioner Muchipal said about. Um, I mean, like, how many times many of us in this body have been here, 
and um, so many times. And and so I am act, I am very grateful for the attention that finally has been brought to this work and the um, and the awareness. Um, the the calls I received from neighbors and others asking like what is going on with this project and I took every opportunity to say we have been saying these things over and over again with projects and that the things that we want to see that we want to be able to support need to be in law they they need to be they they, they need to be in places that they're not now and that is not understood and um, and so I am so grateful to be a part of this body and with this group um, to be able to to call those things out and um, I just I just give given what is before us um, I am um, following in the comments of commissioners Baker and Linda Key and others um, for this vote but I just am um, I am grateful that finally I feel like the problems that we face are being seen. And I and I really, really hope something comes of it. Um, thank you for that comment, Commissioner Underwood. Um, I will say in the process of this, um, I think I became aware that we have been in a sense a very passive commission. And I think uh, we will have a larger discussion on that uh, later on in the agenda. Uh, but I do think I do think there is an avenue for more engagement uh, in the part of the commission. Um, so that's that's we'll have that discussion in later items, but uh, it is it is something that for those of us uh, and you know Commissioner Lindicky Underwood and uh, other uh, other other commissioners that have been serving for a longer period, Edgerton. Uh, we know you know we all know that this is something that has come up repeatedly and repeatedly and we keep asking for tools and we keep asking for um, you know the, the uh, a solution to help us with these with frustrations and we have been in a sense relying on staff to give us those tools and i think it, it, it might be a time to have the discussion of whether what the commission can do on 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 its own so uh, if there's no additional comments, uh, Commissioner Warner, could you, um, Commissioner Mr. Warner, could you explain uh, how uh, the vote, if if a, if a person votes to deny uh, um, the method, if they vote to deny or vote to approve, whether they're required to, how they're required to state their basis on the record. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Uh, commissioners, the, the motion before you is uh, a motion to deny the application based on, I believe it's finding number one. Uh, the maker of the motion has stated his reasons. Uh, you can uh, you can vote, uh, and when you vote, you, because this is a denial, you will have to articulate your reasons on the record. You can do that as simply as saying, I join in the reasons cited by the maker of the motion. Uh, that is probably the easiest thing to do. You could add your own conditions as well. Again, I encourage you to remember that those reasons have to be factually based. And uh, if I may, Chair, I just could I just make one more additional comment? Because Go we ahead, have a, a new commissioner uh, who's going to vote and is it Commissioner, I apologize for mispronouncing your last name. I'm sure I'll do. Is it Tagoff? Takioff. You wouldn't be the first. Takioff. Thank you. Uh, and because you're a new commissioner, I just wanted to point out that um, you articulated some reasons uh, that are opposite of, of, of. I'm sorry, not opposite, but are are different than the reasons offered by the maker of the motion. And it strikes me that those reasons would likely fall under section 61401C4 and 5, having to do with the aspects of design, the, the comments that you made. And so you have a couple of options here. You could simply add those to the record, or you would uh, have the opportunity to ask the maker the motion and the second, if you would consider that to be a friendly amendment as an additional reason. 
And, and if that were adopted, then your fellow commissioners would have the opportunity to say, I, you know, I, I join in, in those as well. So there would essentially be uh, two reasons articulated uh, based on the standards that are in the zoning code for denial of the site plan application. So I'll leave that up to you, but that is uh, because you're new. I just wanted to point out that you have that option. Commissioner Tagioff, would you uh, like Commissioner Perryman to consider that as a friendly amendment to his motion? I had a question first. Oh, go ahead. Um, my, my question is this, um, if the motion falls, in other words, does not get passed in its current form, does that um, qualify as um, an approval or is the, is the project essentially in limbo and would need a new motion to approve? It's my understanding and Commissioner, I mean, uh, Mr. Warner can correct me, but it would be that we would then have to entertain another motion. That's correct, uh, Chair, and if I could. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, commissioners, you have already denied the application because the way the Minnesota law is written, a uh, failure to approve a motion to approve uh, constitutes a denial. And so that is has been done. What you're doing now is the is the next step to complete that process is to articulate your reasons why. So, uh, Commissioner, to your question, if this motion to uh, approve the denial, if you will, fails, there will have to be another motion made. To to approve or deny or in one it, direction only. Well, the logical motion would be to. Uh, approve the recommendation of the zoning committee. OK, then to answer your first question, um, my concern about add, adding on reasons um, is that um, I don't feel I've had or anyone's had the time to properly consider whether these reasons might form um, a legal basis. If I were to propose adding several of these reasons that I've considered, um, I would want that to be something that the commission would have an opportunity to review in detail and think through before casting a vote on it. Um, so I don't see how I can responsibly add um, these additional considerations in at the last minute and would um, would essentially vote on the motion as presented, which I think is clear at this point. OK, I, I don't. Um, I think if a commissioner would want to rely. Uh, that's that's OK, um, but I think if a commissioner would when whenever they vote yes or no, if they vote yes in favor of the motion to deny and they have to articulate their reasons, they they could say uh, and Mr. Warner, correct me if I'm wrong, but they could say for the reasons articulated by the maker of the motion and also the reasons articulated by Commissioner Tagioff if they felt comfortable adding those? They certainly could. And I will just remind uh, the chair and the commission, you in order to uh, fulfill the spirit and intent of Minnesota statute 1599, you have to take a vote today. You do not have the luxury of laying it over. OK, so is there any additional comments or questions before we take a vote? Seeing none, Sonia, can we get a roll call? Commissioner Baker? No. Commissioner DeJoy? I vote in favor of the motion to deny based on finding number one and cited by the maker of the motion. Commissioner Edgen? No. Commissioner Grill? No. Commissioner Hood? No. Commissioner Hong? Yes, I vote um, and cite the reasons um, brought up by Commissioner Perryman and Commissioner Tagioff. Commissioner Lindeke? No. Commissioner McMurtry? Yes, uh, for the reasons articulated by um, the maker of the motion. 
Commissioner Muchipa? Uh, yes, for the same reasons as the maker of the motion. And I'd like to also add um, Commissioner Tegios. Commissioner Said. Yes, the reason uh, that I, uh, Mr. Berman, uh, bring in uh, uh, resolutions. Commissioner Perry. Yes, based on the previous uh, my stated motions, also as the uh, mo uh, information brought forth by Commissioner Tagioff. Commissioner Wesley. I vote yes, um, in accordance with the maker of the motion by Commissioner Perryman and the additional information by Commissioner Tagioff. Commissioner Risberg. Commissioner Risberg. No. Commissioner Underwood. No. Commissioner Tagioff. Um, then if I'm allowed to add reasons, I will um, vote yes um, on the basis of the various other pieces I articulated. Eight, seven. So the motion, the motion uh, to deny the applications uh, is approved. So the motion, uh, the the site plan is not approved uh, for, um, I guess, for the reasons of that uh, of the maker of the motion, as well as the certain commissioners relied on the uh, reasonings by Commissioner Tagia. The next item on the agenda uh, is the comp plan committee. Uh, Commissioner Grow. Uh, so the comp plan committee uh, met again yesterday um, on Wednesday evening for part two of three of um, reviewing of the parking study. Um, it's going along well. Um, the parking study also has a website up. Um, so I. I believe staff has the, the link available and you can get there through the planning commission pages. Um, but we'll be doing one more meeting uh, next week on Wednesday, the uh, 10th um, for the last of, of the three meetings on the um, parking study. And that is it. Thank you, Commissioner Grill. Any questions uh, about the comp plan meeting? Seeing none. Um, Transportation Committee, Commissioner Risberg. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, our next meeting is this coming Monday, February 8th. Um, it'll be an informational item um, on the street improvements uh, that have been planned near Highland Bridge. Um, I encourage everybody to attend uh, if they want to hear more about uh, three intersections uh, that are moving uh, from a three legged intersection to a four legged intersection um, around the um, former Ford site um, and as part of the Highland Bridge project. Um, our last meeting was canceled, so this is the upcoming meeting. I also want to give um, commissioners a heads up uh, that our February 22nd meeting um, will be um, on the Hillcrest transportation analysis. And if you're interested in the Hillcrest project, that might be one that you'll uh, want to attend. Um, that's the end of my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Bisberg. Any questions for Commissioner Risberg or Mr. Dermody, if he's on the phone about transportation. And then communications nominations committee, uh, Commissioner Underwood. Sure, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, a few things, uh, members received from uh, Director Pieta the uh, 2020 uh, planning report. Um, it is, um, 
there's a little bit more there than in the, the past few reports, um, but there's been a whole lot done. Um, really appreciate your time uh, reviewing that and then um, sharing far and wide. Uh, it is a really, really great resource for um, explaining this work and seeing what's in progress. Um, we have our three new commissioners today and uh, the nominations committee um, has forwarded recommendations for um, three other wards to the mayor's office. I wanna thank my fellow members for that work. Um, we've, um, we've received really strong applications and um, I'm excited for um, the addition of, of members to fill vacancies and to address those spots where members have been uh, term limited. And then um, finally, um, uh, the planning director will send around to steering committee uh, the recommendations for officers um, that needs to go through steering committee before coming to the full board. So that's it for me. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Underwood. And um, I just want to say thanks also to the uh, communications nominations uh, committee and uh, it seems like we sort of, we, we've gotten into a routine now of how to uh, fill these vacancies up. So I think it's great. Uh, would any of those new vacancies, I know there are some commissioners who have who have stayed on, um, but uh, for other uh, personal issues or, or, or work issues are, are will be leaving the commission. Would any of the uh, new proposals take over any of those uh, spots for for their information? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we're working through that right now. We did receive preferences from the new members and just need to um, organize the positions. So more to come. Okay, thank you. Uh, Director Pereira on the annual report. Yes, thank you, Chair and Commissioners. Um, I sent to you the annual report um, earlier this week I'm trying to figure out how to share it, screen share it. Um, I've got too many things open. Uh, this is, this is not it. This is the other thing that I wanted to share with you. Hang on one second. Um, all right. So this is what was sent out previously um, to the commissioners. Um, so the Communication Dominations Committee, as Chair Underwood stated, uh, have been working on this. Um, uh, usually in the past, you'll remember, we, we've had sort of a four page format. Um, given that it was a different kind of year, we decided to um, take a little more time on um, various components. So we spoke a, a bit about um some zoning cases uh just to kind of you know sort of be illustrative about the sorts of projects that were before the commission this year um that was a bit of a, a change um we also decided to highlight environmental review this is something that's a little bit more uh, behind the scenes with ped but it's an important piece of our work that i i wanted to um kind of spotlight a bit uh, we were very busy uh because of um uh you know, the CARES Act and some additional HUD dollars that came through is uh, related to the pandemic. So um, uh, something to be aware of. Um, uh, obviously, you you know about the zoning studies, so the RM study and uh, District 14, 15 residential design standards studies that went through the Planning Commission were recommended and went along to City Council for uh, adoption. And uh, so um, just some uh, some of that has broken out in more detail transportation projects um, various uh, master planning um, uh, benchmarks here um, work with wesco on their equity scorecard um, and then uh, the comprehensive plan so <clears throat> uh, that is the annual report if you have comments after you review it um, let us know uh, but typically the next step would be for us to put together a letter and transmit it to um, the mayor and city council. Um, so um, uh, yeah, so we don't have that letter prepared yet, but um, 
we can shortly. And so if you want to take a couple days and take a look at this, uh, send me any additional thoughts that you might have on the annual report. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions and we can move on to the other couple of documents I sent. Any questions for D uh, Director Pereira on the annual report? Uh, if you can move on to the next item, please. Okay. So that's not it. That's, let's see here. So the another document that I sent this morning is uh, what what I call how how did we do, uh, which was sort of the the 2020 a look at the 2020 uh, year, and so it's you know, but perhaps a bit redundant with um, uh, with the annual report, but it gets into a little more detail um, with each project or functional area. Um, and you know what what sort of happened? Were there key milestones reached? Um, and then the phase. So there's a milestone column that says any sort of major benchmark we hit um, on a project. And then the phase means it gives you a sense of like where we are in time. So is it just starting? Is it in sort of a staff phase where we're working on a, a report or maybe community engagement or we participate on a committee? Um, or is it going through an official review process, for instance, coming to you at the Planning Commission or, or maybe it's at the City Council, um, that sort of thing. And then if it's an ongoing project, it, it may not have as clear um, sense of where we're at in the in the phasing, but it, it's it's going to continue, you know, sort of indefinitely. Um, so that that's kind of the structure of this. Uh, this document. And. Um, for some reason, I'm having trouble. Can you see this now? We can. How do we do? OK, good. Um, so I have a bit of a, a, a dis, sort of a description that can I can walk through to highlight a few things uh, here. Um, so a few highlights, obviously, the comprehensive plan was adopted or accepted by the Met Council. Um, for city adoption in November, and then followed by uh, city council formal adoption uh, the same month. So huge benchmark, uh, and you know just the the amount of time and energy it took uh, for the city, um, the community, and and uh, commission and staff uh, to get here is important. It's a ten year document, so um, we have uh, not to say we have plenty of time, but um, there is time to you know it to begin implementation and that's something that we uh, we had staff at the staff level are are ready to do um, with the commission um, the HUD consolidated plan which was a five-year plan for um, HUD dollars that was also um, approved by the City Council and accepted by HUD um, which is a is a, a great resource for for housing related issues um, and data um, and just to get a sense of how we're using our, our HUD dollars. Uh, so I encourage you to take a look at that. It's a five year document. Um, substantial progress on, uh, on plan review for both the Gold Line and Rush Line bus, uh, bus rapid transit projects um, this year. Um, great news about Network Next, which is Metro Transit's um, process to chart out, you know, what uh, both regular bus service, but also their focus this year was where are the next arterial bus rapid transit lines going to be. Um, so they did a bunch of study, boiled it down to about 11 finalists. And St. Paul, we had four of the top scoring. Um, we had two of the top four um, scoring ones in St. Paul. So we have, a, for in terms of next uh, future, um, short term future implementation, which gives us a good shot um, at, at having that next line in St. Paul. And that would be sort of adopted into their plans officially. Um, uh, so um, they've been taking input this month and our city, um, our city leaders, including the mayor, as well as our transportation committee have been very active in that conversation. Um, so that's exciting. Um, on the master plan sites front, uh, we, um, so Highland Bridge, the master plan amendments, as you know, uh, related text amendments, uh, master site plan, a plat, plats, 
um, infrastructure grading plans and initial vertical construction advanced in 2020. So just a lot of work there. Um, Hillcrest master planning continued. Um, so Commissioner DeJoy uh, has been very involved um, as well as other members of the community on the community advisory committee. Uh, so um, uh, we moved to 20 community um, priorities uh, shaped by the community advisory committee um, to four kind of land use maps or approaches um, to down to two kind of finalist um, scenarios for consideration by the end of the year. And now we're doing technical study, um, infrastructure, uh, water and transportation and other things like that on those two finalists. Um, and we'll be going out to the, um, the public uh, shortly for um, input. Um, I mentioned the two big zoning studies, the RM study and the District 1415 design standards. We also had a, a benchmark of the definition of family study um, receiving recommendation from the Planning Commission, and that's off to City Council now. Um, several items that were not on our work program that I, hi I highlighted and why well, I, I just bolded. Um, uh, so, so planning staff uh, supported the design launch and review of applications for the Bridge Fund Relief Program for families and businesses in the spring. Um, we also provided support to the design center, which was something not officially on our work program given capacity, uh, but uh, did end up uh, uh, assisting with reviews of um, the actual Hillcrest uh, site in terms of the initial concepts, um, 848 Payne and 1619 Dayton. Um, so that's something that uh, is is great, and we're trying to also think figure out now the future of the design center. It's it's kind of a collaboration right now between three city departments and trying to figure out a way to make that a little more sustainable and get some outside um, involvement as well, sort of outside of the city involvement. Another project uh, was Resilient Communities Project. This was through the U of M and the Met Council, um, and uh, so we went after a program that uh, provided. Uh, some uh, student assistance um, on a project that we initially thought was related to our industrial uh, upcoming industrial zoning study you'll see on the 20, 2021 work program, um, but it became a little more general as we got into it and became sort of a, um, a way to engage with um, individual workers in, in St. Paul and to sort of get an assessment of um, what has their experience been um, with, with employment um, during the pandemic, sort of, you know, job loss, um, what what uh, industries are they working in if they are working now? Um, what are their strategies going forward? Uh, and this sort of brings in a bit of a workforce um, uh, development component. Uh, the initial idea was that it would be tied to uh, businesses in industrial industrial sectors and particularly those that are growing in terms of employment. And how could that inform our industrial land use project uh, or study this year? Um, so um, we did get some good information from that and uh, still re reviewing that um, and will help us uh, move into this year's work. Um, a few things we didn't get to um, that you may notice uh, and sort of high level the uh, environmental reviews for um, uh, so for the Rivers Edge project, the Ramsey West project, uh, Luther Seminary, um, it's a bit sort of on pause. Um, and uh, the Snelling Midway site. So there's an uh, environmental review document that um, actually, it's a, got a five-year period. It, it expires this August. So um, we anticipate that that may that update process may happen um, this year. Um, so unless others people have questions about that, I can talk about the 21 work program. I'll pause for a second. And if not. I will go to that 21. Can you see the 21 planning work program on my screen? We can. OK. Um, so kind of it's organized similarly. Um, a lot of the same projects you'll see. Um, but what we've tried to do this year is uh, a little more information about um, tasks for each project that are um, moving forward as well as our key staff listed. So if you have you know, um, questions about something on the list, um, they can be resource people. And th then also um, the sort of the why, you know, what are we, what's the reason for us engaging in this work? Um, so um, a little bit different format from last year, uh, gives you a little bit more detail. 
um, about sort of uh, what, what's ahead. Um, so in terms of like sort of themes for this year, uh, looking forward, um, we expect um, more activity this year on some of the larger development sites. So the River's Edge project I mentioned, we've been in touch uh, recently after a bit of a communication um, gap uh, with uh, the developer and Ramsey County on this site uh, downtown and um, working with them on sort of informing them about zoning applications um, and processes. Uh, but we're also going to be talking to them about um, uh, public realm design uh, coming coming up with some of other other city departments. Um, I mentioned the Snelling Midway um, environmental review document update that may occur. Um, we also um, expect some additional development at the Highland Bridge site, um, as well as getting uh, into a review of a master plan document for the Hillcrest site later in the year. Uh, in terms of transit, which is on this screen, I just realized, um, the big kind of highlight is the Riverview Transit Corridor project is moving forward, uh, led by the county. Uh, there's going to be various committees. Some of those are technical involving staff and elected officials, and some of them are more community focused and um, uh, uh, involving members of the community, including um, our Commissioner Grill, who will be involved on the Station Area Planning Task Force. Um, so that will begin to meet, as well as a broader community advisory committee for Riverview. Um, and we also will see further plan review um, progress on both the Gold Line and the Rush Line BRT projects. Um, in terms of moving forward on the comprehensive plan, um, you'll notice um, towards the end of the neighborhood and site redevelopment planning section, district plans review. So every year we have sort of ongoing district planning um, updates happening with working with di various dist district councils. But in light of our new comprehensive plan, um, we need to update our guidelines documents um, so that they um, have the latest and greatest in terms of um, Comp Plan 2040 policy um, to, to be looking at. Um, but also, it's a chance for us to um, have a conversation with the district councils to be uh, understanding, you know, if they have a district plan adopted and if it hasn't been updated in a while, you know, are, do they have plans for updates? Um, do they think that decertification may make sense? Um, you know, do they, you know, are they going to be moving forward on a district plan update formally to um, to give, to, you know, have a conversation with them on that. So there's sort of related items um, that kind of straddle comp plan implementation and, and district sort of neighborhood planning. Um, various zoning studies uh, will be advancing um, on the screen here. So uh, we'll, um, uh, as we've mentioned, the city Parking Regulation Standards Study. Uh, it's a better name for it than that, but um, essentially updating our parking requirements, um, looking at um, strategic um, parking reductions or elimination. Um, we'll be moving forward. Um, uh, we have the uh, various uh, other studies that are required by law. So the Mississippi River Critical Area Ordinance Update um, will be moving forward. Um, the um, religious accessory use zoning study, which uh, is required uh, due to um, uh, actually due to a legal settlement with the city. Um, uh, shortly here, you'll be seeing a pretty short study, the unsheltered homeless services study. This is a, a use that gets at um, the need for daytime um, shelter uh, services. Um, and so uh, we have a text amendment coming to you very fair, uh, fairly soon. Uh, to to accommodate that use. Um, I mentioned this industrial study, uh, which you can read a little bit more there. Um, uh, and then the Comp and Neighborhood Committee has also heard already about two studies listed here, um, the one to four unit infill housing study and the intent of the zoning code uh, study, which will look at our site plan and conditional use permit uh, findings in part. Um, both of those thinking about, you know, an eye towards, um, you know, equity, af affordability, resiliency, um, big values of our comprehensive plan. Uh, and we've mentioned a lot of that today. Um, uh, in particular, um, uh, just point out the parking study and the one to four study, um, you know, uh, are going to um, remove barriers for additional housing in the city. Um, the, the one to four study, um, will explore permitting a, a greater number and type of, of housing options and uh, single family only districts. Um, so single family only districts 
in our city represents 70 over 70 percent of our our city land area that's zoned only for residential use um, so that study will be um, significant uh, in terms of you know potential impacts to additional uh, housing production across the city um, even though we've tried to kind of think about these in parallel separate structures um, the accessory dwelling unit ordinance that was um, adopted a few years ago and, and updated in 2018. Um, recently, we've had sort of various conversations that, um, you know, folks have indicated there may be some tweaks we want to make to that, uh, what you can do with ADUs. And in the context of a one to four study, it certainly makes sense to begin thinking about if you have additional, you know, two, three, four unit uh, density uh, on a block, on a lot, um, how does the ADU play into that? Maybe there's some additional flexibility that we want to consider. So that's something that we'll we'll look at as well as part of that that study to you know the goal of facilitating additional production um, removing barriers um, at least on the zoning code side uh, where we can uh, to to facilitate just additional construction um, uh, and then uh, just to point out something else uh, the on the last page other un, other essential work um, the um, st paul development uh, well, actually, it's St. Paul Trends is what we're calling it now. It's the new name for St. Paul Market Watch. Uh, some of you may know uh, a few years ago, we had a, a quarterly kind of data uh, assessment of various different indicators with, with development, building permits, demographics, uh, things like that. Um, we have a, a new and improved um, and a dynamic uh, uh, online tool that we're um, just finalizing now, um, uh, moving to a lot more sort of automated updates, um, uh, pulling in our DSI building permit data, um, uh, also looking at some demographic uh, data indicators. And there's a actually a section that gets at health, some of the COVID data tracking uh, with the county and the city. Um, so that's something that will give you a lot of information. Um, actually, staff, um, commissioners, and the public at large, it, will, it should be a, a great resource. Uh, and I uh, will have... Um, our lead on that, Bob Spalding, come and present on that at a, at a future planning commission meeting. Luis, there's the mm -hmm. uh, commissioners asking questions. Would you like them to ask them now or when you're done presenting? I actually am done, so um, I am happy to take questions, please. So I see Commissioner Lindeke and then Commissioner Risberg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I am, first of all, glad to see the return of the, the trends report. I was looking at that the other day and I saw it hadn't been done for a few years. Um, but my question was about uh, co coming back to the conversation we had earlier about this development and the difficult work of implementing the comprehensive plan into the zoning code. Um, I don't see inclusionary zoning on this list of the work plan. So can you just um, tell us where you're at with that? I know we've talked about it before at the commission here. Yeah, Commissioner Linicky and Chair, thank you. Um, we, we've been talking about that, you know, so those of you that weren't with us uh, earlier in the year, um, in 2020, <clears throat> we had a, a staff kind of effort. Uh, we were initiating staff effort to uh, look at it, IZ, look at inclusionary zoning, um, uh, and uh, we're engaging with our housing team as well. Um, and so that was going on. And uh, then with, um, uh, with the pandemic, um, you know, a decision was made that uh, for a variety of reasons, I guess, uh, one, uncertainty about um, market factors, um, and two, just, you know, un not knowing what was going to happen with housing production generally, um, uh, that we, we decided to pause the project. And um, one of our, our next big steps was to um, engage with the commission, you know, especially the Comp and Neighborhood Committee, but um, also our city council, because it's obviously a, a pretty big um, legislative uh, change, policy change, uh, ordinance change. Um, so to, to get them involved early on, um, uh, you know, especially with our legislative aides who uh, support our city council members slash HRA board uh, uh, commissioners, um, ensuring that they they understand and kind of have a have a um, uh, understand kind of what their priorities are as well early on in the process. Uh, we were going to go out and, and get a market um, 
uh, sort of study or feasibility study uh, to do that. And so given the uncertainty, we did not um, engage with that, that consultant um, at that time. So uh, more recently in putting this together, you know, the question of uh, do we uh, bring it back uh, and, um, you know, do we re-engage and do, is it, are we in a, a better place now? And so um, we're still assessing that, but at this point, um, part of the um, the challenge I'd say is, you know, I guess if, if we were to, uh, you know, if, if the city council were to prioritize this um, over say something else we have in our, our zoning studies list, um, that's something that, that we're gonna obviously respond to uh, but I, I don't, I don't know what to take off of this. That's, that's significant. Um, and, um, uh, there, you know, there are a couple other studies that, that will move the ball forward on, on, um, housing construction and, um, that I think are important and I don't, I don't want to short change. So I would like to continue that conversation, um, uh, with our elected leadership, but, um, at this point, um, yeah, that, that's where we're at in terms of our staffing uh, capacity. Uh, thank you. Can I just follow up, Mr. Chair, one second? Go ahead, Commissioner Lindsay. Um, yeah, I, I understand the staffing issues and I appreciate your thorough response. Um, I, I just would put my uh, two cents in that I think this should be a priority and um, my sense of the housing market is that it, it's going gangbusters regardless, and there's even bigger spread between rental and um, and home ownership markets. And so, um, I don't know. I think that you should make it a priority, and I guess our job is to talk to the council about it. I suppose. So, thanks for the information today. Well, we're on it. Um, and is Mr. Warner still here? I'm not sure. Mm, I don't see him. Okay. Well, um, well, I'll, I'll before I make my comments, I'll go to Commissioner Risberg and then Commissioner Baker. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I was I raised my hand or I put the cue in the box because I I had the, exactly the same question as Mr. Linicky. Um and um, given the sort of heart-wrenching discussion we just had over um, this development today, I, I really would encourage um, PED to try to move the ball forward on inclusionary zoning so we can at least get some of these issues on the table and um, discuss whether we can have more tools to help make this, you know, new housing more affordable for more people. Um, so I would second everything um, Commissioner Lindicky said, and um, I hope you'll um, strongly consider it. I, you know, I hate to move anything else off the plate, but it, today's discussion was just a, another <clears throat> example of why we need, we need to have these, this kind of study moving forward. Thank you, Commissioner Risberg. Commissioner Baker. Uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks, um, Director Pereira. I um, appreciate the report out and all the amazing work that you and staff are doing. Um, I, I guess not to reiterate everything that I've heard, but I I, I agree um, with uh, Commissioner Lindicky. And just to highlight a, a few points around the inclusionary zoning um, study. Um, I think, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was more so characterized around the response to kind of why aren't we moving in that direction, is that there are a lot of other things that staff right now um, consider a priority. And um, for probably a lot of different reasons. I know how it can be a staff when elected officials say that we need X, Y, and Z done. Um, I am asking uh, you and your team to allow us to help you um, with um, this being a priority. And if if we, um, Chair, I'm not necessarily trying to put you on the spot, but in general, if, if we need to meet with elected officials to say that right now, um, you've asked us to be a part of the commission, we are saying that this is important. This is what we are hearing. This is what we feel like we need. And right now, um, 
is coming across as if this is, ends up being a priority, then something has to leave your system just based on time and workload and everything else. Um, I, I want to reiterate that this is important to this commission. And I want to continue to keep saying it in many different ways that this study is important. And, and if and when we don't do it, it comes across as those things that are important to us as commissioners um, aren't important to the city because they're not made a priority. So please allow us to help you in moving this forward to be um, a priority in the department. If there are concerns that other things in the dis uh, other things in the city um, need need to be moved. So I, I just I bring that up. I want to be a partner. I want us to be a partner. I want us to help help in this situation, but I also want you to really hear us that we're saying that we want this to be a priority and we don't see it and we would like to see it. Uh, Luis, I'm wondering if you could respond to that or have a response to that. Yeah, Chair and uh, Commissioner Baker and and others. Um, yeah, I appreciate that um, because, you know, it's it is. Uh, it would be challenging to take on uh, take it on again at the current um, you know, without taking something off, you know, one or more things off the list. Um, and that's just for for my team. Uh, I, I have spoken a bit with our housing director um, who, um, just to give you a little window into into that conversation, um, uh, you know, so there are a few other things to consider here. Uh, we, we have the tenant uh, protections ordinance going into effect. Um, uh, we have uh, a very large uh, emergency rental assistance uh, program um, that uh, our, our housing team is really um, uh, jumping into now and, and uh, to to get off the ground. Um, uh, I was essentially told, you know, if, if we're going to get back to this, you know, in the short term, um, say next quarter or two, um, we may not have have the full participation of our housing team, which to me doesn't um, doesn't make sense. Um, to proceed forward uh, without without their their involvement, um, uh, you know, I think certainly some work could 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 advance um, before they can jump back in again. Uh, but um, it is something to consider. And then another consideration is um, uh, even just the impact with um, uh, sort of existing housing in the community, existing multifamily properties. Um, uh, you know. The, the effect of what you know, the effect of the eviction moratorium, um, and some of that uh, on individual property owners, you know, so having to pay a mortgage but not getting all of the rent um, that is needed to to cover uh, is another consideration. And so, um, granted, an IZ ordinance wouldn't probably take effect even if we start studying it um, this year. It wouldn't take effect until you know, however long into the future. <clears throat> so the impact of it wouldn't be felt immediately, but uh, just the the uh, some of the things that are going on in in the multifamily sector too um, are are important context points to to consider and are informing um, uh, I think both you know housing as well as uh, housing staff as well as uh, our elected leaders leaders um, at the council. Um, so certainly, I would welcome your um, assistance uh, with if you know if it is in fact a large priority like it seems to be. Uh, as I'm hearing, um, to communicate that uh, and work with work with staff, work with me to uh, uh, to bring that forward. Um, and then, you know, this work program is is well. I like to set it at this point in the year and communicate it externally. Um, some things sometimes things shift, uh, so certain things might come off uh, if we you know we were to add um, add this back in. So I appreciate uh, Commissioner uh, and Commissioner Riley. I, um, I'll call on you here in a second. I just uh, I think while we're on the subject, I'll just I'll just say the comment because it relates to what I noted earlier about being uh, we've been uh, to to my understanding now a, a quite passive commission in regards to uh, giving staff the the staff and and Director Padeda who understands. Uh, Kind of the day-to-day -day dynamics of his uh, workload and staff and resources, the leeway to prioritize that list for us. And um, I think I, I would I, I think it would be good for 
uh, for us as commissioners uh, to understand what authority we have in establishing that priority. And so um, I, I, my question was for Mr. Warner to try to explain that and, and he's gone, but Luis, I'm wondering if we could at the next planning commission um, put on the agenda sort of uh, a, a legal understanding or a, just a explanation, like a educational presentation on the authority of the commission uh, by Mr. Warner uh, so that we can um, determine as a commission how we would like to proceed understanding what powers are bestowed to the commission. Um, and I think it, it's only, you know, it's not about, it, it, to Commissioner Baker's point, it's about working with staff, working with the elected officials. Um, I, what I heard today was that even commissioners who voted in favor of that application really are prioritizing the IZ uh, zoning study or the inclusionary zoning study. And so, you know, I, I hear all the commissioners when they say um, it's a big priority for us and on the graph that we're seeing, it's not reflected there. So I think it's, it's going to be an issue that's going to continue to come up with the development around the uh, with the stadium, um, additional development just all throughout the city is going to continue to come up, and I think it's something we just need to address. Commissioner Riley. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, um, Director Pereira, for your um, clear outline of the work plan. Um, and as you know, as uh, a new commissioner, I didn't feel confident voting on the very complicated issue um, of the Alatus project. But I just, I just want to note that um, inclusionary zoning and affordable housing has been a part of sort of vaguely described in the comp plan since at least the previous uh, plan, 2030 plan. So we're talking about, you know, 15 years of um, sort of intent to uh, provide enough affordable housing for folks who live and work in St. Paul. Um, and this um, hiding behind the market has been um, sort of PEDs and some of the policymakers um, maybe uh, fatal flaw when it comes to um, effectively planning for um, significant housing affordability in our state and in our city. Um, and so I think, you know, given what others have said, um, and as a person who, you know, when you love something, you it is it behooves one, I think, to be both its strongest um, advocate and its strongest critic. And so I just want to put in my um, vote for, uh, you know, my endorsement of the concept that inclusionary zoning is a really important thing. There's a lot of really great resources out there from other municipalities who have gone down this path. Um, and I know that there's not enough staff necessarily to do this work, but when we tell um, the residents of, of St. Paul that affordable housing is important to us, and then we don't stand up for it um, as policymakers or as, a, as an advisory body, then we don't um, meet our due diligence of, of the work that went into the comp plan. So um, I just wanna, wanna put that out there. Um, and I will certainly talk to my council member um, and others um, and the mayor to, to help make room in the work program um, as needed for um, PD's uh, planning and housing and DSI's um, development staff to, to work on that, that issue. So thank you for the opportunity to comment. Commissioner Wong, I, I see that you wrote a comment um, in the messages. Is there anything you'd like to say? Yeah, I just wanted to second what many people are saying about um, the urgency behind getting inclusionary zoning done. And I also want to add that it takes a long time, the whole process, right? Getting um, a contractor to do the research, to do the study, to do the market analysis, to draft the ordinance. And so it takes a lot longer than we always expect. And so I think that getting started sooner, um, as soon as possible, would be great. And so as a commissioner, I'm here to support staff. I'm here to advocate to city council or the mayor, or whatever 
is needed to to bump it up as a priority and we're here to support. Luis, um, uh, is that something we can put in the agenda or should I reach out to Mr. Warner um, myself? No, uh, I can, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Chair, thank you. Um, uh, I can I can talk to, to Peter and, uh, you know, one thing that could be done uh, is the commission if, if, you know, there's general agreement with what's been discussed uh, and interest in this, um, the commission could ask, you know, pass a resolution asking asking for the study uh, to resume because it you know again to remind everybody we did do probably three or four months of work on it that were that was quite intensive uh, so we're not we wouldn't be starting fresh we would be going back to where what we where we left off um, so we could um, uh, have the commission entertain a resolution to um, to ask for the study to resume the study um, and we have a city, a, pre a previous city council ordinate, uh, sorry, resolution that asked for the study, along with a whole host of other studies, frankly, uh, both on the PED work program, uh, which we uh, we have made, we've we've scratched, you know, we've begun down that path, uh, including the one to four study. Um, uh, but you know, that just the number of things asked for at that time were were not, you know, we didn't have the capacity to to deliver right away. That was from 2018. So that's another precedent we could look at uh, and reference um, in a resolution. I mean, it would not be hard to put together a PC resolution uh, for it. Uh, and that might be the best way to uh, to communicate if that's in fact what the commission wants to do. Um, I would have to, you know, move some things around, figure out with my team, uh, you know, does anything come off? Uh, and if so, you know, maybe it gets pushed back to next year. Um, that's a bit of a process, but it's not it's not impossible. I mean, we, we can do it. I better to know it now uh, and, and start planning and building it in than than waiting. Um, uh, and yeah, and then just how do we get the housing team engaged uh, uh, in the sh in the short or maybe more medium term, given what we know about their work program right now. Um, some of those things um, they're you know, they're just we're just stretched quite thin, even even though they're they're fully staffed. So uh, thanks. Thank you, uh, Director, Director uh, Commissioner Risberg, and then Commissioner Baker. Yes, thank you, Director Pereira. Um, I um, really appreciate that um, option. I think it's a good one that we should uh, consider a resolution moving forward um, to to resume IZ the IZ study um, process. And um, my question is, given how um, shorthanded you are in terms of staff. Um, um, Commissioner Hong talked about, um, she used the, she, she mentioned a contractor. Uh, it takes a while to get a contractor hired and stuff. D does PED ever hire contractors to supplement the work of staff and to, to move things forward? And are, is, there, is there funding available to do that? Is there something we can do to help? Yeah, Commissioner um, Brisberg, we do. We have hired um, consultants for different different projects, um, and and that was part of our next step was to engage a consultant around you know, sort of a technical piece of it uh, of the study. Um, uh, so that would de would definitely help. But that there would still be you know staff um, to manage that and 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 to you know figure out how to how to build whatever we're, we, you know, what, whatever we come up with into our code and sort of bringing it through our process and all of that. Um, so yeah, for sure, uh, that was part of our assumption. Um, obviously, we'll have to look at our, our, our adopted budget for 21 to see um, uh, what, what kind of uh, resources we have uh, to resume a contract this year. So there's some questions with it, uh, both on the, the, the money side as well as the staffing side. Uh, probably the staffing side is a little easier to figure out um, if, if we don't have enough funds on our consultant budget, but uh, we could definitely look at that. Commissioner ba uh, Baker. Thanks, Chair. I'll be really quick. Um, also, Director, I appreciate you um, sharing that information. It gives me more insight into what staff is dealing with. I definitely want to make sure that we as a commission um, understand the weight of, of this. Um, so 
I, I would like to offer a, a chair a suggestion. Um, I think that it will highlight the importance of this. Um, it, this is uh, in partnership with um, the director and PED, um, but I would like to have a, a letter or a memo go to um, the mayor's office um, or city council members because what the director is highlighting is that something is need is going to have to be um, something is going to have to be um, removed um, from their work plan. So I and and that is a decision that I, I I don't take lightly, but I do want to highlight that if if this is to move forward, then something more than likely will be removed. And with that, that means that um, there may be uh, commissioners and or the mayor that is really pushing something. And I I don't want PED to go it alone. I I need them to hear the voice of the commission. I would like them. I don't need them. I would like them to hear the voice of the commission. I feel like it will be supportive of PED and the work um, that the director is trying to do. And also it will highlight um, from our earlier conversation the importance of this inclusionary zoning study and how much it means to this commission. So as as a suggestion and actually as a request, I think that a letter around this important zoning study, not saying that staff won't do it, more so saying that staff is going to need to make some tough decisions and we respect that, um, but we are going to need their patience because something is going to need to be removed off their plate. Yeah, I appreciate that comment, Commissioner Baker, because I think, you know, as commissioners, we volunteer and we hear these um, you know, we hear the applications and we hear we take the time to review the materials prepared by staff. But there's a lot going on with staff. There's a lot going on in other aspects and other departments and at the city level that we may not be aware of. Um, that is uh, just as important um, or has a, a large importance in um, the, the decision of staff to, to do what they're doing. So uh, I think we don't as a commission, I think we want to express our view and highlight the importance of what we see on a daily basis and kind of the issue that we're tasked with. But I think to, if I'm understanding you correctly, we also don't want to um, maybe fumble some balls uh, that are being juggled in other locations that um, may make things situations uh, situation worse. And, and another aspect that's also really important. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, I, you know, I think a letter, a, a PC resolution, you know, there's probably room for for both. Um, um, yeah, I, I think we can continue talking about this, but definitely we can we can talk about um, commission authority and uh, even bring probably bring some initial language um, uh, for for this um, for consideration. Uh, and in fact, I think we have a steering committee that we wanted to set up for the 19th, so it might be a good thing to re, uh, discuss there uh, first uh, before the, the full commission meeting. I agree, and and, um, and I, I, you know, thanks, thanks, Luis, for for the clarification um, and for, you know, uh, being open to the ongoing discussion. But by no means do I think that this is like the end of it and, you know, we're just going to do it. I think I, I really think we just need to have an open discussion about. You know what what the options of the commission are. So. Um, See no additional questions, so I'll move on to the task force liaison reports. Um, I, Commissioner Grill left. I don't believe she's met yet. Is that correct, Mr. Dermody? If he's on. Otherwise, Commissioner DeJoy. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, do, uh, anything with regards to the uh, the task force that Commissioner Grill was assigned to? I think you you might be the person to ask about that. Might be wrong. Uh, if you're talking about the the Hillcrest master plan that Commissioner DeJoy is on, I I can help with that. Oh, uh, is I see Commissioner DeJoy is on. Uh, she can I, I'll ask her about that. But do you know of anything about the uh, West Seventh corridor? 
Oh, I'm I'm sorry. I I am not working on that one. Uh, Anton Jervy is. I don't know if oh. Mr. Jervy's on the line. Uh, Chair, this is Anton Jervy. Uh, there's no update uh, for the review uh, corridor st uh, stationary planning task force. Okay, uh, Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jervy. Uh, uh, Commissioner DeJoy. Yes, we have a meeting um, February 16th is our monthly community advisory committee meeting. Um, <clears throat> we expect to be doing more community engagement in March. I don't have details, but probably we will be discussing that at the February meeting. And I did post in the chat here the link to the initial development framework for your information. Um, we haven't met since our last planning commission meeting, so I don't have any updates. Just um, moving forward, February 16th. And that's my report. Thank you, Commissioner DeJoy. Any questions about the task force? All right, any old business? New business? So we will be adjourned for the February 25th, uh, February 5th, 2021 St. Paul Planning Commission. Thanks to everybody for uh, attending and for everybody who spoke. Thank you for your comments um, uh, today and we, you know, we'll be back in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks everyone. Stay warm. Thank you.